Hello, everybody. My name is Arika Virapongsi. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth webinar series, the first, fourth webinar of our series. Um, and our webinar this time is um, entitled The Pipeline of Earth Science Data to Climate Resilience and Its Value for Real World Decision Making. Um, as I noted, this is the fourth webinar in our series. The series is called The Socioeconomic Value of Earth Science Data Information and Applications. Um, and it's also part of ESIP's mission. Um, so this webinar is, is helping support um, ESIP's mission. Um, and for this webinar, um, we're, we're um, happy to be highlighting um, the agriculture and climate cluster of ESIP um, and some of their work that they've been doing, particularly on their, de their development of a pipeline to transform agriculture and climate related research and applications into case studies as part of the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, or CRT. Um, and importantly, most importantly, these CRT case studies document how people are building resilience for their businesses and their communities um, by using relevant data and tools. Um, and for this webinar, we'll have a series of presentations um, by the, the Agriculture and Climate Cluster. And then we'll also have some space for some audience discussion. Um, um, and, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nancy Holber Heinrich from Knowledge Motifs. Um, and she's first going to present a summary of the webinar, and then she will present about how researchers can promote the use of their data and or their tools for climate resilience. So Nancy, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great, thank you, Erika. Hello everyone, Nancy Hobel Heinrich, Knowledge Motifs, LLC from San Mateo, California. I am the uh, co-chair of the Ag Climate Cluster along with Bill Tang, who's coming up following me. This is the, we Nancy? wanted to give you an, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. I can hear you. Okay, Okay. Sorry. All right, so okay. <laughs> I, I, was, I enjoy talking to myself, but not for an entire uh, half hour. So glad somebody was listening. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to give you an idea of what we were planning to cover in the webinar. I will first be talking about the Climate Resilience Toolkit itself. And uh, then Bill Tang will be talking about how we are using the CRT to develop a pipe a pipeline for developing case studies using uh, agriculture and climate related data that uh, people uh, researchers are using out in the field following bills uh, explanation of the pipeline. We'll have Dr. Rich Bernkoff talking about his research on uh, value of information using Landsat and agricultural land management, which we think could be a potential CRT case study. So after Rich's presentation, we'll have, that's, uh, we'll have a group discussion, a short amount of time where everybody on the, on the call has an opportunity to help us develop uh, a story for, for based on Rich's uh, presentation, Rich's, Rich, Rich's data and the, and the scenarios that are involved there in order to see whether we could uh, come up with an incipient case study there. Uh, and then following that, uh, Bill will give us a transition to the next, uh, another project that Ag Climate is working on, which is uh, data to decisions provenance that, and, and our uh, colleague Brian Wee will be making that presentation with a follow-up by Erika. So uh, we'll, uh, in terms of questions, we are asked that there only be clarifying questions, questions that uh, if you need clarification on either any of our discussion, any of our presentations, but especially Rich's, and then, and then of course, there'll be room, as I mentioned, for a uh, time for discussion with that uh, group, group work later. So next slide, please. So, uh, so the topic, as Erika mentioned, was how researchers can promote the use of their data and or their tools for climate resilience. And I want to say that these are slides, I'm presenting the slides, but and I've adapted them a, a slight uh, amount, but they are really slides from Luann Dahlman, who is the co-managing editor of the CRT and has been really instrumental in helping us in ag climate work on developing this pipeline and, the, and different case studies. So uh, next slide, please. So the CRT itself, in case you're not familiar with it, is a portal that has been developed by the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, their U.S. Global Change Research Program. 
the CRT has been managed is managed by the NOAA's Climate Program Office and hosted by NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. So, uh, and that's the website there. If you want to look and see see what's what's there, we'll be talking about that uh, a bit as well. Next slide, please. So one of the things that the Climate Resilience Toolkit uh, presents in their portal are a catalog, or is a catalog, of more than 300 tools that have, people have developed for building resilience to climate. The tools are categorized broadly by the framework that uh, CRT uses for the, their presentation, which they call Steps to Resilience, including these five steps here, exploring hazards, uh, uh, assessing vulnerability and risks, investigating options, prioritizing and planning and taking action. And there are other filters as well that can help you find tools that meet your needs. Uh, next slide. So the, uh, uh, each, of the, each of the tools has a page that describes how it could be used for, how, or how it might be used for building resilience with links to the tool related assets and, and tool partners. Uh, next slide. And the other thing that the, the CRT provides, which is where we are, have been focusing more of our efforts in ag climate is on the case studies. So the goal of these case studies is to share these, uh, you know, situations or these, these uh, opportunities that people have used to inspire others to build climate resilience. So this is a, the, the slide, the uh, illustration on the left provides you know the first page of them what we'd like to show you next in a, in a minute is what is the case study that we've been working on that we've gone through to completion so next slide the case studies are essentially brief stories that highlight examples of real people or communities who recognize the climate related issues and have been taking some action toward building resilience next slide so the stories are 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 that are, are brief stories of 400 to 800 words, with a uh, ideally a struggling protagonist that uh, is really showing examples that others can follow of those real people and and the real situations that they've they've been working on. So uh, next slide. So this uh, is an illustration of the the use case or sorry the case study that we have been working on. Uh, kind of gone successfully from beginning to completion at, in the Climate Resilience Toolkit. It's, a, uh, it's the, uh, the result of collaboration between CRT editors, the Ag uh, Bill and myself in the Ag Climate Cluster, and uh, researcher Dr. Crystal Powers, who is at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and who is working with a group of people, including extension agents and so on, to uh, find ways to have conversations with people, the beef producers in, in the upper Midwest, who need to address uh, changes that are happening around them that affect beef production when they're they not all that uh, interested in talking about climate change or are skeptical, skeptical of climate change itself. So the next two slides, which you can go ahead and run through, uh, or first slide is, you know, gives you more of an idea of the story itself from the toolkit, including the discussion about the audience. So it's really a, a sense of who this is targeted for. And then the next slide, it describes some of the different steps of the process that the uh, Dr. Powers and her, her colleagues used to get to the point of providing some options to the stakeholders. They used uh, um, a method from the National Park Service handbook that talks about, that uses the development of scenarios to, to have these conversations. So next slide. One of the things that they do in, in the course of the scenario building is to come up with artifacts that can help the, the, the people who t for with whom they want to have the conversations think about their options. So this slide represents one of the, what was developed in the course of the process uh, uh, of the conversation building that helps beef producers identify what their options might be in different scenarios in winter, spring, where there might be warm, weather, warm wet weather, uh, warm, dry weather, uh, cold, wet weather, et cetera. So you can see uh, it's, it's really an interesting tool that they came up with and it's proved to be quite helpful. So the next slide then shows what they actually came up with in terms of options that these folks could use uh, to, to deal with real operational uh, issues and management in when these different scenarios came up. 
So in terms of the next slide, in terms of the developing the story itself, the, you know, there was a main character, uh, there's a goal that the uh, the, the group was trying to, to work towards an obstacle, which was the skepticism of the people with whom they're trying to have the conversation and then the solution they came up with. So next slide. This represents a template that CR, the CRT editors and others and we have been using to help people develop uh, case studies, for, you know, that kind of story from the, the data that they're working on. And the idea here is that, you know, researchers are, are often very interested in the research itself, you know, the, the problems that they're trying to solve. And, but in order to communicate the, the science itself uh, in a way that shows the value and shows people how the data, for instance, can be used, this is a simpler way to think about it. So we encourage you to think of this, keep this in mind, and we'll show it again when it comes to the conversations that we'll have about developing uh, the case study. So keep this in mind as we as we hear from Rich. And then next slide. This is this whole approach is one that CRT editors have used based on the work that's been done by uh, Randy Olson on, from the book Houston We Have a Narrative: Why Science Needs Stories. So it's an excellent book and and provides some really good examples. So next slide. So, so the way that it's been working is uh, if you want to contribute a case study to the CRT, they ask you for three things, and we've been working with researchers to do this, draft text, relevant visuals, and a completed metadata template. Next, uh, next slide. And, and so this is a result that came that, that came from uh, what was Dr. Powers came up with. Editors use that, those assets to build the story, get her approval, and publish. The, the case study. Next next slide. So what's possible is a, a range of uh, options for people who have uh, text or tools to contribute. And every, anything from a, an outline of a story based on that template we looked at to all the way to uh, a, a research article that's been published in a journal. Any of the uh, or, or a draft in between. The CRT editors can accept any content uh, along that that a continuum of story completeness. They work with your text and add headings and visuals, and then uh, the, what's submitted is reviewed and approved this before the story is published. So uh, if you want to contribute, you can go to this place on the CRT website to submit either a tool or case study, or you know, if you're interested in, if you've got ag climate data, uh, then we're, ha we're happy to talk with you as well. So the next slide. The CRT website is really, to summarize, is just a public face for federal efforts to build resilience. And the real goal is to encourage communities to take steps toward resilience. So uh, next slide shows you Luann's uh, contact information if you want to get to her directly and answer any questions. So uh, next, I guess I hand it off to Bill. Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And thank you turning my mute off. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the webinar, first of all. And uh, this is Bill Tang. I'm a co-chair along with Nancy of the Agriculture and Climate Cluster of ESA. Um, so Nancy has described the CRT as case study and the importance of the story. Um, um, maybe, oh, Eric, Erica, can you show the next slide? Yeah, I'm going to briefly describe how we, the Agriculture and Climate Cluster, uh, contribute to the CRT case studies uh, via a process we call the pipeline. Uh, this is a poster that you see on the screen on, on the pipeline that we uh, uh, presented last year at an ESA meeting. Um, now, I know the print is too small to read, uh, but for the, our current purpose, that's not too critical. The slides will be available after the webinar, so if you're interested, you can take a closer look uh, later. The contents are still mostly current, uh, I updated just two things. Uh, the first one is on the left, the blue arrow, contains an updated URL for the QR code for Ken Burns' uh, fairly short five-minute video on the story. Um, it's quite interesting, uh, his take on story, uh, in which he says that, you know, the interesting story is where one plus one equals three. The second thing I changed on the right outline in red is the CRT webpage that Nancy uh, showed earlier for the scenario planning for beef production case study. Uh, it's our first case study that has made its way through the pipeline 
to the CRT case studies uh, database uh, and published on its website. The, the left one third of the poster is again on storytelling, its power and importance, and on the ABT uh, story template. Uh, and but therefore, uh, the right two third of the poster is on the pipeline process, which is really on a high level, just a two step process. Uh, so we start with um, some current research or application of interest, usually uh, related to agriculture. Uh, we invite the people involved to present on their work at our uh, CRT workshops that we sponsor at the biennial ESAP meetings. And typically two speakers present on their work uh, in the first half of the workshop. And then in the second half, uh, the attendees of the workshop together with the speakers uh, try to compose the basic stories using uh, the story template of the presented work. So here under uh, the number one in the poster are three stories from a couple of the earlier uh, workshops uh, a few years ago. Um, and then, then the second step of the pro uh, pipeline process under the number two in the poster is uh, iteratively working with the CRT staff, uh, in particular Lua and Dahlman, who is uh, our point of contact there, and the speakers um, or story owners to move the stories down the pipeline towards um, some kind of incipient case studies until it has matured enough uh, for us to hand off to Luann and her staff uh, to take it the rest of the way. And that's pretty much it for the pipeline. Uh, we always have a lot of fun working with the attendees and the speakers in filling out these uh, basic stories. Um, and as Nancy said, you know, the good news is that you all will have a chance to do exactly that uh, later on in the webinar. Um, okay, a couple more things before I finish. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a list of five workshops that we've held so far, along with the subjects presented and the presenters. Uh, again, the red outline is uh, of the scenario planning beef production case study. Uh, for working storage of these stories uh, in, in Sibian case studies, next slide, please. We, uh, we use the Open Science Framework OSF facility uh, of the Center for Open Science. Uh, in in OSF, OSF, you can create projects. So we created one for our CRT case studies pipeline. And then under each project, you can add components. Uh, for us, the components relate to these stories and their related incipient case studies. Uh, the directory contains these components in some kind of hierarchy. And clicking on the red outline component, which is that beef scenario case study, next slide, please, um, goes to that components page. And then under wiki, part of that page, we can add other information. So here, uh, so for now, just a link to that external URL for the Beef Scenario webpage in the CRT website. Okay, I'm uh, almost done. Next slide, please. Uh, so as you listen to the following presentation, please keep, again, this story template in mind and try to fill in the blanks uh, based on the presentation. Now we'll come back to this template on the other end of the presentation. Thank you. I'll hand this back to Erika. Oh, Rich. Yeah, so I'll, so thank you, Bill, for, um, for, for that presentation. And so, so far we've heard, you know, we've had an introduction about what are the climate resilience toolkit case studies, what that looks like. Um, and then um, Bill gave us a nice presentation on how the cluster has developed a pipeline to um, develop these case studies. And so to follow along with this, um, we'll have Rich um, Bernkoff now who will present a use case that um, we can then use to as an example for how to develop a um, CRT case study. So um, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Marika. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, again to Erika, Nancy, and Bill for inviting me to present a research study on the value of information in an agricultural context. Next slide. So 
give you a little background. The issue that we faced uh, back in the mid 2000s was what is the economic value of the Landsat continuity mission? At that time, I was with the USGS and we did this work in house. The objective of the study was to demonstrate the VOI or value of information of Landsat imagery in a hypothetical example. In this way, we could look at an innovation rather than just a cost savings. The challenge we had in front of us was how to link Landsat data to an agricultural regulatory decision. And we had to, in so doing, we had to develop an integrated natural science economics framework to assess an agricultural environmental trade-off of crop production and potable groundwater. So now on the slide, the decision that we had using the earth observations from Landsat, we had to recognize that it does involve some level of uncertainty in scientific measurements since it is remote sensing, that the value is dependent on whether the earth observation reduces the uncertainty in understanding the outcomes, and that we have a specific decision which was to regulate water pollution that involved the use of Landsat. Our approach was to take was a VOI impact assessment and in this approach we applied the Landsat archive in a retrospective analysis to adapt agricultural production to reduce nutrient leaching into groundwater in a land use policy. Next slide. So the motivation for the project were some unforeseen consequences that impact crop rotations and increased groundwater vulnerability. And so, like I said, our first challenge was how do you connect imagery to groundwater management? So one of the things that we first noticed is that there were uh, a legislation that was passed for subsidies for biofuels. And if you look at these few images here for the years that we conducted the study, is that in the outline field in yellow, during the time that the legislation was passed and implemented, the two, bill, the two pieces of legislation, you'll notice that the rotation of crops from corn yellow to soybean greens went away. And then finally came back in 2012. So we found that that was some kind of interesting and that was supported by the statistical data that showed that there was an increase in corn production and a decline in soybean production because corn was tied to the biofuels. Next slide. So our, VO, our objective was to measure the incremental value of Landsat for policy and financial decisions. The VOI impact analysis, <clears throat> again, is expected, the, what are the expected benefits of a decision with and without Landsat for agricultural land management and regulation of groundwater contamination. The drivers, as I said earlier, in the system were the Energy, U.S. Energy Policy Act of 2005 and the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 that had a biofuel supply requirement and contained subsidies to farmers. We also had another driver, which was the US EPA health standard, that drinking water cannot exceed 10 milligrams per liter for nitrate. That because nitrate reacts with other chemicals to form carcinogenic compounds. The stakeholders in the problem were obviously Iowa farmers, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources uh, and EPA. And this study did take place in the northeastern part of Iowa and that there were private and public drinking water providers who at this time already had some issues with some of the shallow wells that individuals own and in some cases even the deep wells. Next slide. So the case study covered 5.4 million hectares in 35 counties that we knew from the application of nitrogen for fertilizer, it took about 114 pounds per acre of nitrogen in that 35 county study area. And that um, soybeans and most of that 114 pounds leached into the uh, soil 
and soybeans took three pounds per acre of nitrogen and uh, it was it was an uptake and that so there was very little of the nitrogen that could migrate away from the site we use the cropland data usda cropland data layer for uh, production estimates for 2001 to 2010 and unbeknownst to me when I started this study that 80% of drinking water in Iowa is from groundwater. We were able to get data about 32,000 wells that ranged in the private from just below the surface all the way down to 1,220 meters and we looked at 630 watersheds and almost 8,000 of the of hydrologic response units, which, as it says, that the response would be the same in those each of those units. Next slide. So our objective, again, was to measure the economic value of Landsat in evaluating the impact of groundwater pollution based on farm activities in Iowa. The strategy was to demonstrate how regional resource management can be improved while public health is maintained and we use, we did a case with and without the uh, earth observations from Landsat. We would then assess and target groundwater vulnerability from nitrogen application and that we had to couple producers and resource managers by using spatiotemporal information from markets and natural systems to aid in maximizing agricultural production while not if possible decreasing groundwater quality. Uh, we implemented this study using the Landsat archive to link land use and groundwater pollution from non-point sources and what's called a statistical survival model of nitrate accumulation which we then created as an indicator. We applied the approach in a regulatory decision to evaluate the impacts of a regional land use adaptation program. Next slide. So as I've mentioned to Bill Tang before, this is the sausage making. How do you, what are the steps to turn the Landsat data and science into geospatial information for an environmental regulatory decision? And in this, we had to figure out that you can't use the data directly. You have to transfer it into some form that is useful for information of where people have to make real decisions. So starting up in the right-hand corner of the slide, we have the a cartoon of the physical process that goes on. And it's straightforward. You have corn, you plant the corn, you add some fertilizer, and it leaches out most of it into the soil and then eventually makes it into either a shallow or a deep aquifer. That we were able to use the well data that we had and that uh, and water and did a water quality evaluation and that is in uh, C uh, where that is the time to failure of particular test wells that we were able to get from the state of Iowa and USGS that we then had to apply the EPA nitrate standard and look at whether or not we exceeded at any of these wells the maximum of 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate in the water. For the area, uh, the study area in A, which is our 35 counties, uh, we, then at, we then had to look at this for a temporal land use baseline, which is based on uh, uh, slide part B, from the Landsat imagery in from 2001 to 2010. We then had to combine the 32,000 wells and land use over time in B to estimate ca what we call ca well capture zones of the drinking wells and that is in figure D in the, on the slide here. So for each well we had to figure out what happened to that what the nitrate as it flowed from the surface at a particular place to a well that was remote in space from it. We calculated, let's see, uh, okay, so then what we did is that in the bottom right hand side, part E, 
is, and the, we did a statistical regression equation and then could forecast the time to failure or the, whether or not the well survived over a period of time based on the historical land use of each of the parcels in the 35 counties. Next slide. Okay, so we had to then calculate different types of numbers. We had to calculate the yield by crop for corn and, corn and soy. We had to express the trade-off between corn and soy uh, crop production in dollars and so surviving potable groundwater with replacement values such as bottled water. And so by that we could then look at the, the specific trade-off between how much production of the agricultural crops and then what does that cost us in terms of contaminated groundwater. So we calculated, like I said, the yield by crop in each year for each parcel, then multiplied that by the year's crop price to estimate total revenue to the farmers. And that we then applied the model for different combinations of revenue and water quality for each year for alternative patterns of land use in order for us to get a, statist a valid statistical sample. Using the Landsat indicator that we developed that I mentioned earlier for accumulated nitrate at a well from its capture zone, we could compare the amount and value of crops to the amount of potable loss in potable groundwater for alternative land uses over time. That way we could actually look at the impact of spatial temporal land use between what we would have as a more environmentally conscious uh, applicate, uh, land use pattern versus what the actual was. So Landsat gave us the baseline, then we could test that baseline that we were then able to uh, allocate, it allowed us to estimate the economic gain or loss over the two outputs. The Landsat data provided us a way to make the comparison in adapting land use to maximize production of agricultural, to maximize production of the two agricultural crops and retain as much potable water as possible. So we did find that between 2000 and 2010, some groundwater wells are threatened by nitrate contamination and could fail to maintain drinking water quality in the next 10 years because we did forecast out from that, from that final date of 2010 that we estimated that if everything were just right, the maximum estimated VOI for adaptation of land use with Landsat is an annualized 858 million plus or minus about 200 million in 2010 dollars and the net present value of 38.1 billion dollars plus or minus 9 billion for the Iowa case study. Now that assumes that, ev that all land could change its use to be able to sustain or maintain the groundwater quality but that um, instead we know that's not really true in the real world and that let's say if 1% of the lands changed over uh, that people were considering the environmental impacts that the VOI achieved with Landsat would be an annualized 43 million and a net present value of almost 2 billion. And thank you, that's it. Um, thank you, Rich, for presenting that use case. I think that really demonstrates some of the complexities in these use cases and how that can be a challenge to developing um, a CRT case study. Um, and so now we have about 15 minutes for um, an audience discussion that will be led by Nancy. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yeah, very interesting, Rick. Rich. Um, I, if, if what we're trying to, what we're trying to do is come up with a main character, goal, of obstacle, and and so on. Uh, I think it would be interesting to get a sense of of your sense of this, Rich. But also then, if other people have 
uh, ideas in mind about uh, who a protagonist might be. Um, it might, I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that you know, we're, we're, we're really trying to think of a protagonist who could really use the data as presented and or the tool. I know, Rich, you talked about a, a Landsat indicator that you, you came up with as part of the uh, research. So maybe that's something that we could think about too as, as, as a tool. But to start off the discussion, did you have a sense as, as we've talked about it in the, uh, in the past of who you think the main character would be in a story? I think in this story it would be either the county or the state of Iowa because of the responsibility, the health responsibilities, and also um, some of the groups that support the farmers to get the inf people aware that adding the fertilizer does have consequences. And I, what I found to be remarkable here is people don't know that they're drinking what they've put on the field. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and, and we've seen enough stories in the last decade or so of towns and individuals who were not aware and they were then affected in a very negative way, illnesses, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. So I right. feel that there's a whole range of protagonists here mm -hmm. and I don't, you know, and it's hard to even identify because it's a non-point source problem. All we right. can say is the capture zone. Right, right. But before we go on, I, uh, I think someone has a question for Rich. Erika, you said someone has a question for Rich. Yes, there's a question and maybe uh, Rajendra can, um, I guess, ask it again if, if it's not clear what it is, but um, asking, is obstacle better than risk or uncertainty in climate science? I think it's risk because um, obstacle to me means somebody is not doing something that, well, I guess I'll put it a different way. The risk to me is involves, are you making the right decisions with the information you have? And so what we were trying to do is could we reduce the uncertainty of when the wells would have become, exceeded the standard or maybe never because the geology does change over space that we could then say that um, the risk is reduced because of, of the contamination problem because the uncertainty of the information was reduced because we could make the connections between satellite and the actual is that yeah. it yeah yeah thank you thank you yeah. mm -hmm. All right but in in this case as you're describing it i mean that if the goal is to i mean is the goal to reduce uncertainty there or is the goal to ultimately to uh, to as you said you suggested rich reach the uh people whose responsibility is in in the county or state of I Iowa to uh, to know let people know let farmers know about the the, the, uh, the impacts in, in dollars you know in real in, in real value uh, mm -hmm. economic value to the results of their actions if, if the goal is to educate that's one thing if the goal is to uh, you know reduce uncertainty, then are, are there different protagonists there who yes. are? Yes, yeah. there are, because yeah. the reduction, the decision maker, in the way you just said it, there are two sets of decision makers. Mm -hmm. The first decision maker, and we ran into this in a different, in another study, is the decision maker has to decide whether or not the well, you know, in the future, will the well exceed? Mm -hmm. which is a question of uncertainty and risk. As far as the users of the water, um, getting the information about that could be an obstacle because of, for whatever management reasons there might be. Uh, you know, I can even, off the top of my head, I can think if there's a landowner versus a land renter, then whose interest is being served if you uh, have to change the crop? 
mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the, the the payoffs are all different. But there, so the, there's the, the obstacle, and we did run into this a little bit, is to whether or not the farmers themselves are willing to sacrifice the revenue and kind of, if they don't have the information, they are at risk, but it's a different risk. That's a true health risk as opposed to a decision risk where you're reducing uncertainty uh, in the process. Right, right. Yeah, well, I mean, and anybody anybody has wants to jump in here and, and suggest anything or ask questions or contribute contribute to the conversation. You are more than welcome. I don't need to, to, to. I'm just here to guide and kind of keep things going. But if you, anybody has thoughts, please jump in. I'll take a pause and see if anybody does. Uh, yeah, this is a bit. I just want to add that uh, it seems like you know Nancy already mentioned two possible storylines. So. There could be multiple stories, and so we'll be interested to hear what other people um, have thought of as you were listening to Rich. One thing I could add is that it's possible to use the same kind of modeling for other types of uh, chemicals, agrochemicals. Mm -hmm. When we were doing the study and had some contact in Iowa with the with the State Department of Natural Resources, they were very interested in well, what happens if we did this with pesticides? And they were they were very concerned about alar for apples in the western part of the state. Mm -hmm. So it's not the the modeling we did is not just applicable to the one particular chemical so that there's the possibility that if someone you know if interested in a case maybe the case is to be able to uh articulate with a different chemical to see the reactions in those in those kinds of cases would you still use the same the lancet indicator for instance and the uh we'd, we'd the have same to background data? Yeah, we'd have to re we'd have to estimate a different one, but it's the same question: is you know how long does it take for these pesticides to get to travel through the surficial geology, the into beyond the uh, the soil, and then eventually to the aquifers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, you know, it was a surprise to me when I started doing this. It didn't take nearly as long as I thought. To and to, it's all, to leach through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of the permeability in the upper layers. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is that the geology dips, dips toward the toward the, the Mississippi. I, mean, I think it's the Mississippi, yeah, the Mississippi River. And there's some other issues that if you go downstream, you reach the dead zone down mm -hmm. by New Orleans. So there's some right. bigger regional questions too that come out of this. Right. Right. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So, so in in a sense, we're it sounds like we're really talking about the um, that the solution, you know, to jumping to the end here is really is the algorithm that you come up that you come up with the different parameters of the algorithm, and then um, if the goal is to reduce uncertainty, but the what would the obstacle be in that case? Then uh, it's just like you said, is to get people aware. Yeah. And who is going to transfer that information to the individuals? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So translation, and, the obstacle is translation of the data, the complex data then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's even reaching the people. Yeah. Because who's going to tell, you know, I, you know, I, I can tell you this study took us three years to do. And mm -hmm. so through all that, we had to learn about it. On the other hand, it wouldn't take that long to communicate to a person who is familiar with the area and with the problems to be able to translate that into something fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, seems like it seems like a, an approach that could be used there. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments based on what you've heard? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Dave uh, Jones. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Dave. Hi. 
I was just wondering if, um, you know, the, the, the telling of the stories is great. And I'm wondering if there's, if Climate Resilience Toolkit or there's a, uh, maybe the climate cluster has a plan to offer data like geospatial data that can uh, support these stories that can be told in a mapping uh, environment. That's interesting. Uh, actually, that's a, kind of a nice segue in some ways into our, our next, uh, the next project we're working on, although I guess we should, I don't know where we are time-wise, uh, Arika, but in the CRT itself, there are usually references to the data that, that are being used. So for instance, with the beef uh, production case study that we worked with, a lot of the, the, the climate data that the stakeholders use to, pre, you know, to come up with that artifact of the, uh, you know, the different, different scenarios with the cows and the trucks and all that sort of thing um, came from the National Climate Assessment. Uh, so, reports. So, so, and within that report, there, there are different data, uh, citations to different data sets and so on that are below there. But CRT tries to do that as much as possible to the extent, you know, that they can get it from the people who are contributing the data. So, uh, or sorry, contributing the story. So, so yeah, that's definitely possible to do. I, I don't, I don't know um, what, what of the things that, that we're, just to give a little pricey of what Brian will be talking about is that we're, we're, <clears throat> we're seeing how important that connection is, you know, to, to, from the, from the data that's being used to decisions. And so I, I won't take away Brian's thunder, but that's, that's something that, you know, has been a question for us as well. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, Go ahead. And I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm just, I'm looking for, you know, um, links to not real complex data, but data services, you know, web map services, you're kind of going in and out, Dave. Oh, sorry. Not yeah. sure how to fix that. You, you said uh, last I heard was looking for. Yeah, looking for geospatial data ah, services. Services. Mm -hmm. That could be offered because, you know, many people don't know how to deal with all the raw data and the net CEF. Right. Services be offered that help tell this story because then you can combine the story with geospatial data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave, that, that's something we had to grapple with in our research is I'm an economist, so I know very little about the science. I did, like I said, I did work at USGS, but that's the crux of the issue is how do you transfer the data from the of the imagery into something that is information that's useful in decision making that took us that was the hardest part of the study is that translation because it has to be uh, available it has to be consistent through time and it, and it has to be assured that it will continue mm -hmm. Uh, to, just to add to that, uh, this is Bill. Um, so Dave, the, the the CRT, the case study, you know, as Nancy said, uh, do reference the, the data wherever they can, but none of those, I, as far as I know, uh, is in any kind of analysis ready form, which is I think what you are uh, um, well, wanting to to see uh, uh, be available. Uh, so uh, when Brian talks about the, the project, uh, the, the data to decisions project, uh, I think he'll, um, he'll touch on that as well. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah. So uh, um, what, what's the uh, result of, uh, Rich, the result of the study in terms of, of this particular uh, example of working with the the people at uh in iowa who are interested in who who to whom you wanted to present this data just very quickly we um we had well actually uh, i see that francoise is on here uh jay perlman and i went to iowa to meet with the farm bureau and we had a pleasant discussion but i think what i what we needed to do was, I think, what you guys are trying to do, which is how do you simply put mm. what the issue is 
and how do you grab their attention without it becoming um, kind of a an argument over why'd you pick us? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And I felt that we weren't there to really try to sell them anything. We were there to get their attention and say, let's try an experiment to see whether or not if we use this kind of indicator, does it, will it change any minds about what, how people use the land? Mm -hmm. And, you know, now we're getting into all kinds of, you know, political, economic questions that lots of people don't want to face. Right, right. But I don't see, I don't see how the water is going to survive because when we first started the study, like I said, we found places that were already above the, the, the water quality standard. Mm -hmm. And people were still drinking that water. Yeah, it's interesting because in, in some ways I can see how you know, the case study that we talked about earlier with the scenario building that, that the approach that they took uh, to, to getting the conversation going and to, to have really people really think about, you know, practicable options would be would be might be useful in this case. So if, if scenario building were the tool using your data and your algorithm behind it, you know, the, and it, you could come up with that kind of beautiful little colorful grid kind of thing that that uh, that they came up with, and, which is an, and which is a model actually in the the Park Service uh, explanation of their process as well. Then that's you can put the two together and maybe you know have a different story with uh, a different solution. But anyway, interesting. Well, the, but the, the thing is, is that what's kind of interesting is that our study was retrospective so these people uh -huh. live, they live through this period mm. and that's what was so intriguing about the discussion we had is that we had the actual thing that happened mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't us and, and then we built the scenario going forward saying that there was no friction in a real estate market for transactions that allowed you to consider the environmental quality associated with the water. Mm. Well, I think the other thing is that there's probably not so, it's, it's difficult to as, assign value, economic value to the healthy, to, to, to good water too, you know, in terms of the health considerations, that's sometimes a di very difficult part of the equation to, to prove how much oh. value is there in, in, you know, two people, to, to society in, in having that kind of, you know, healthful, better, better well, we, health condition. We, yeah, we took an easy way out. We said you had to replace <laughs> it. We, you had to replace it with bottled water. Mm -hmm. And that gets expensive very quickly. Especially if you're watering crops. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. A lot of water bottles. Right. Well, well, I don't know if it's the same thing as far as putting that, and that brings up, you know, it's an interesting question because that is a question in the Central Valley of California, mm -hmm. is um, if you if you extract the groundwater at some point, what is the water quality uh, from all the stuff that was put in at the surface, and are you putting it back on the plants, which is what's happening, um, how how valuable is that water? I don't know what it means to water plants with containing all of the, the bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, okay. Well, it looks like we're running out of time. We've got our, our timekeeper is telling, telling us to move on here. So um, just to, to remind you all, this is the kind of thing we've been doing at our uh, sessions, usually winter and summer meetings at at ESIP, and also uh, we often hear conversations about, hear these kind of presentations on our monthly calls as well. So if you're interested in this kind of uh, topic and approach, or have one of your own tool or uh, your own tool or your own data, please let us know. I'm going to hand it back to, I guess, hand it to Bill now. Um, yeah, thanks, Nessie. Um, so so that's, part of, that's part of how the sausage is made in our case. Uh, to generate these stories that eventually uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, eventually become the CRT case studies. Uh, before we get to the last part of the webinar, uh, let me do a quick summary. Uh, so, 
Nancy began with the CRT, its goal of building resilience, including its case studies features uh, and stories. Uh, I then describe our process for generating these stories and moving them down the pipeline uh, towards becoming CRT case studies. Uh, and the story template plays a key role in all of this. Um, and then Rich presenting his study and the group helping to formulate that initial story for his study uh, is essentially the pipeline in action. Uh, as Nancy said, we, we, this is pretty much what we do in our workshops. Uh, the next and last presentation will place all that we've discussed so far uh, in a larger context, um, that is the tracing of the provenance of decisions, uh, including those uh, contained within the CRT uh, case studies. So I guess the next slide, and I'll, I'll pass this on to Brian. All right, Bill, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, next slide. Now this will be, this is only a one slide uh, presentation and Nick. Um, so this is a project that is funded by the ESIP lab, ESIP lab and my co-PIs are Bill, Nancy on the phone, Tom Nayrock and uh, Arif Rustam who is uh, Bill Ting's uh, colleague. So there are a total of five of us on this project and uh, there's insufficient time to talk about the entire project. So this is just a teaser and we may have a separate presentation uh, at some future point in time. But uh, to give you the, the problem that we're trying to solve, uh, this is, and the problem that I'm, I'm about to state is outside the scope of our project. And on the screen, you see where our project is, it's, um, which I will describe. But what I'm about to, to describe next is, next is outside the scope of our project. What, what, what we are trying to enable in many years time is if you as a resilience planner, say you are a resilience planner uh, in somewhere in North Carolina and you have received uh, monies from the federal government to uh, make your city more flood proof, how do you do it? Um, how do you use floodplain maps? How do you use uh, data from NOAA models that estimate the amount of storm surge coming in in a future storm. How do you connect all of those and trace and, and relate it to a decision? So in, in, a, in the far future, meaning seven to eight, 10 years from now, what we are trying to do again, which is not within the scope of the project is to let that resilience planner in New, uh, uh, New, uh, in North Carolina feed a two or three page document, almost like a request for proposals to fortify that city, feed that document of, of that RFP to a machine. The machine will actually use natural language processing to retrieve um, solutions that other cities, for example, New, New Jersey, which was hit by Hurricane Sandy, it will retrieve relevant resilient solutions that have already been uh, uh, drafted and tested by other jurisdictions. And these solutions that the machine retrieves uh, will go all the way from the implementation measures that the cities, or in this case, say New Jersey, how, how did New Jersey prevent, uh, how, how is New Jersey addressing future potential flooding? And what were the what were the alternatives that they considered? How are these alternatives linked to model data and raw observation data? So, in other words, the full traceability, as you see in the diagram on the screen, the full traceability of existing resilient solutions, starting really from observational data and how observational data is run through models uh, to produce indicators or social ecological indicators or data products that end up in publications that ultimately inform your decisions. And so again, that scenario that I described between New Jersey and, 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 and North Carolina, that is not within the scope of this project, but that is what we are trying to enable within the project called Data to Decisions Provenance 
we're, we're trying to figure out what you need to develop in terms of technology that would allow a machine to uh, quote unquote read or parse the RFP that the that, that, that the North Carolina city manager puts into the machine to getting the machine to figure out uh, what are the relevant resilient solutions already out there to also getting the machine to figure out to figure out how do you put the disparate pieces together of a, a, a solution an existing solution like that in New Jersey how do you connect those decisions all the way back to uh, data and models that inform those decisions and so that's really the the, the scope of uh, uh, what we're trying to do uh, under this project is just to describe some of the technologies involved and and that's all that I wanted to say about the project uh, and I guess back to Erika. Hi yes thank you um, Brian and um, thank you um, to all of the presenters um, and particularly to the Ag and Climate Cluster um, for leading and um, and participating in this webinar. Um, and I see there's there's one more question here and I'll pass that on to Brian Rajender um, that maybe he can answer you directly after the webinar. Um, but um, you know, I think that this has been a really interesting webinar. It's been great to see what um, one of the ESIP clusters has been working on. Um, I don't know, personally for me, I think there's a lot of places, areas that I see that really relate to my own work. Um, and maybe some of the other participants here feel the same way. Um, we really got to see how you know this, this, the Climate Resilience Toolkit can be useful to, to other data end users um, in, in a simplified, a, you know, more or less simplified way of how you can break down a complex use case into something that, that, that can be useful to others. Um, and then also, um, I think ending with Brian's talk, we got to see how, um, how we can really trace how that data can be um, contribute to, to decision making. Um, and I just like to point out, um, so this webinar was the fourth in our series in a six part webinar series on socioeconomic value. Um, the, the next webinar will be from the disasters life cycle cluster of ESIP. Um, they're going to be looking at managing disasters through improved data driven decision making. And um, all of these webinars are going to be available on, um, on the ESIP YouTube. So somebody asked a question about um, following up on some of these um, on the on the webinar and the the slides. Um, I'm going to upload a bunch of links that I'll be that are they're here on these slides. So if you want to just copy these or take what you need. Um, so I just want to point out also the ESIP meeting. All right, the ESIP meeting that is um, in January, and then the Agriculture and Climate Cluster is open to any participation from everybody. So the links to their meeting um, and meeting notes is here. And most importantly, I'd like to highlight the GeoValue community. They've been our partner on coordinating this webinar series. Um, and they also have a very interesting book that's out um, that was out last year. So if you want to take a look at that. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And please, I hope to see you next month. Thank you, Erika. Thank, thank you, Erika. Thank you, everyone.